Okay, I'm delighted to be here. I've been asked to speak to you about the latest recommendations on standard and advanced lipids. I think you know we're all waiting on new guidelines. Uh, the timeline that I was given at the last National Lipid Association board meeting is that they would be released to the public on October 26th with anticipation that they'll be uh, talked about at AHA in November. We have to wait to be seen. However, there are other recommendations and guidelines there are, that we need to be aware of so that we can do a better job with um, reducing the risk of coronary events in our patients. And there's a lot of, uh, there's expert consensus type panels, but there are national recommendations in Europe and in Canada and some international things that can help us. Um, one thing about recommendations that you need to be aware of is in order for something to meet the criteria to be included in above the lipid profile in a national recommendation, it has to add to our ability for clinical decision making. It has to make some kind of difference. Not only does it have to make a difference at baseline to have predictive value, but it has to continue to help us once somebody's on treatment. So something that may be predictive at baseline, if it falls out, once you throw in a bunch of lipid-altering agents, it's not going to make it in the guidelines. Another thing that's required for things to be recommended in the guidelines is they have to be available. It has to be tests that if you're doing guidelines for a whole population in a whole country, it has to be available, easily available to the population. Another thing is kind of like drugs with the FDA. If you have two things that do the exactly same thing, whether it's a drug or it's a lipid biomarker, you're going to use the one in a national recommendation that is the least costly to implement. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go forward. My disclosures are yes, I work for Cleveland Heart Lab. I am proud to say that. The Cleveland Heart Lab has a commitment for prevention and for education and reducing cardiovascular events. I am all about that. If that's a conflict, so be it. What about lipids? Is there anything new as far as standard lipids? And the answer is yes. There's a lot of new things that have come out last year related to doing standard lipids in kids. The NLA came out with um, some expert information, but there are new national guidelines that you need to be aware of for practice with kids that have also been endorsed by the um, American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics. The NLA came out with recommendations about screening all kids, um, and basically because of FH and the underdiagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. They recommended the non-fasting, um, non-HDL cholesterol as a screening tool. Uh, they certainly say you can screen people earlier if they're in high-risk situations with families with FH or premature heart disease and major risk factors. Uh, and just a quick review, non-HDL is still unfortunately not reported on all reports, but this just kind of shows you that non-HDL captures the cholesterol in all the atherogenic lipoproteins not in HDL, it's a calculation, it's total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol. So what's the big deal about FH? The big deal about FH is that we're missing it. It's, a, it's much more common um, than people have realized. It's just as common as type 1 diabetes, Down syndrome, and uh, cystic fibrosis. Patients with FH, if they have heterozygous FH, they can have cholesterol levels between 350 and 500. That's about what the range would be on the cholesterol levels and the incidence as well. Homozygous FH is much more rare. It's about one in a million. Sometimes these kids have cholesterol levels as high as 1,000. They have heart attacks at six years old. They need liver plant transplants. It's rare, but it's out there. But FH is treatable, and it, the problem is that there's estimates that only 20% of the patients with FH are being diagnosed, and that's a crime. We talk about treating people early and avoiding things. You know, there are a lot of people who can benefit from treatment if we find these kids. Currently, the people with FH, uh, less than half of them are actually being treated as, as well as they should be as well. 
So the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, these are national guidelines that have just come out in November of last year that you need to know and be aware of, and I know some of you are working with kids. These are comprehensive guidelines to reduce cardiovascular risk. It's not just about lipids. They're talking about the whole child. We're talking about metabolic syndrome, smoking, um, obesity, et cetera. And the emphasis is on primordial prevention. In other words, preventing the risk in the first place. These are the first new lipid guidelines for kids since 1992. They are evidence-based, and they're using the um, procedures from the Institute of Medicine. Family history, the way we've been doing it, we're missing up to 60% of the people with FH. They recommend non-HDL as a screening tool. Again, you don't have to fast for non-HDL. They do not change what the target would be for kids. The LDL would still be under 130 mis, uh, milligrams per deciliter. But they do say that we need to be screening standard lipid profile, or actually the initial thing they say is non-HDL in all kids between 9 and 11 years old, and then all kids between 17 and 21. We want to capture these kids not when they're in puberty. They recommend an, uh, the non-HDL as the screening tool, and then if it's abnormal, follow it up with a fasting lipid profile, do it twice, do the average, et cetera. Standard lipid profile on adults hasn't changed. I think we're all familiar with that. The total cholesterol is a direct measure. The HDL cholesterol is a direct measure, and one of the speakers alluded to it earlier, HDL isn't even standardized. That's kind of crazy, but it's true. LDL cholesterol is something that we've used, and there's a lot of clinical trial data, um, but it's based on a calculation or a formula. Triglycerides, I think you know, are very variable, depending upon how long somebody fasted, what they ate in the last couple of days. And then the non-HDL on many of the reports gives you an idea of the atherogenic lipoproteins. So the evidence is very strong about LDL cholesterol. LDL is still the primary target uh, of therapy based on every kind of clinical trial that you can have. And with statin therapy, statin against placebo, which is easier to show benefit, whether it was reduction in primary prevention or in secondary prevention, you have clear evidence that lowering LDL cholesterol lowers risk. So here's just a cartoon kind of graphic of all these different sizes and categories of lipoproteins, and the white bar just shows you what the non-HDL captures. So why do we want to look beyond the lipid stroke profile? Is there something else we can do that's going to help us do a better job? Because we know that half the people who have normal lipids are still having events, and you have residual risk. Statins are wonderful. We reduce risk between 25 and 40 percent, but you still have up to 75 percent of the people who are having you know, heart attacks and having events. So the Frito wall formula is an indirect method. It measures. Um, you know, the standard lipid profile depends on the total cholesterol, the HDL, and the triglycerides. And so there's measurement uncertainty here in the calculation. You can end up having some variability in LDL of 15% or even up to 40%, some papers say. And we know now that LDL is not the best predictor of cardiac events. There are newer tests and methodologies out there, and there's actually a boatload of them out there. And the question are, which ones meet the qualifications to become national guidelines or that really help us make a difference in treating our patients? So we want to go over those. Um, this APOB um, is a thing that we need to be aware of. It is incorporated into some statements and some guidelines. And this just shows you that all of the ApoB lipoproteins, um, you know, capture um, these atherogenic particles. The U.S. Health Professional Studies, I think this was published in 2005, shows you that of LDL, non-HDL, and ApoB, the relative risk reduction with CHD is best predicted with ApoB. Dr. Essie went over this metabolism yesterday. This is a little different emphasis. His slide said LDL. It's really ApoB lipoprotein that infiltrates into the arterial wall. It's glycosylated, oxidized, getting into the macrophage, stimulates the foam cells, the inflammation. There we go. We have atherosclerosis growing and going. 
In 2008, um, this is a consensus statement from the American Diabetes Association and the American College of Cardiology for patients at cardiometabolic risk, and they include ApoB as a goal of therapy. ApoB, they say, should be less than 80 in patients who are at highest risk and less than 90 in, in others who have major risk factors. In Canada, Again, these are national guidelines now that meet those criteria. They have added ApoB into their guidelines in 2009. And not only did they say ApoB should be less than 80 in patients in our highest risk cohort, but also in patients who have a 10-year risk, according to Framingham, between 10 and 20%. The National Lipid Association's um, information that came out from the experts last November actually said that ApoB is reasonable in patients at intermediate risk, and instead of making it 10 to 20 percent, they say 5 to 20 percent. So that's getting even more people who benefit um, from ApoB. There are, the reason this gets into national guidelines, there's a lot of data about its predictive value, not just initially, but look at all these, and it's hard to see from these trials, but the ones at the top is it shows that when ApoB, the relationship between ApoB and cardiac events in both primary and secondary um, trials. And so if you lower it, whether it's on statins or niacin or azitabide, you know, you do reduce um, coronary events. The advantages of measuring ApoB are that it identifies all of these particles that attach and deliver the cholesterol ester into the intima and that generate atherosclerosis. It is a better predictor than LDL of cardiac events. It includes all the potentially atherogenic lipoproteins. And each atherogenic lipoprotein carries only one ApoB, so it gives you an idea of what the quantity of the particles is, and you don't have to fast for it. Um, atherosclerosis is caused by the lipoproteins. It's really not about cholesterol, even though we talk about cholesterol. It's about these lipoproteins and, and how everything goes on. This is a new book that just came out this year, and one of the authors is Michael Davidson, who was one of the founding fathers of the Na National Lipid Association, world-renowned researcher and lipidologist. Uh, and they suggest in this book that our treatment should lower ApoB to the same population percentiles as what we use for LDL and non-HDL. Statins lower um, LDL on average of about 42%, whereas um, you know, statins lower ApoB about 33%. And what they're saying is if we only treat to LDL goals because of the discordance, we're going to miss people. And I think that's what's happening and why we're seeing problems still. So we need to be more aggressive to be maxly uh, effective in, in prevention. We need to get to these ApoB targets. And in these patients, we're probably going to need more potent statins or more combinations of therapy. They've given us a nice chart here that gives you an idea of what these numbers would be. So if you look at the left column and you come down to the 20th percentile where you see an LDL goal of less than 100, if you go on over to the right, you see the equivalent population prevention uh, guideline for ApoB is 78. Hence, if you get an ApoB under 80, you're getting there. Does that make sense? But look at your highest risk cohort of patients. When you want an LDL under 70, the ApoB would need to be under 54. Dr. Bale showed us a perfect case yesterday, you know, with Superman. By the time Superman was looking good, what was his ApoB? 54? Did they read the book? I don't know. But it's like if you, to put the fire out, if you water down ApoB, you are not going to be feeding the fire. You know, we need to um, put those fires out. Um, what about ApoA1? HDL, we could spend weeks here talking about HDL. It's extremely complicated. There are probably at least 80, Apo, uh, AP, 80 um, proteins regarded to HDL, the proteonomics, the lipidomics, the confusion. Um, I was meeting with Peter Jones at Baylor a couple months ago just talking about HDL. I said, do you mean it's like that thing, like half of what we know is true and the problem is we don't know which half? And he goes, it's more like 90%. I'm like, oh my God. You know, so we really don't know a lot about HDL in a lot of ways, um, but we do know a, a good bit 
uh, about APOA1. So let's talk about APOA1. APOA1 is the major apolipoprotein protein for HDL. It gives us a good estimate of AD, uh, HDL concentration. It's significantly different here. You know how there was one ApoB um, on each atherogenic particle? With ApoA1, you can have up to four on, on, a, on one single HDL. And ApoA1 seems to recycle, and Ernie Schaefer says maybe up to eight times. When we talk about myeloperoxidase rendering HDL dysfunctional, if Peter Toes, who's the current president of the National Lipid Association, he will tell you that MPO kills APOA1 functionality. So the APOA1 promotes cholesterol efflux from the arterial wall, and so if you don't have the cholesterol efflux, this whole idea of direct reverse cholesterol transport port is getting shut down. So what are the major apolipoproteins that we know the most about? And you can see from this chart that if you have high levels of APOA1, you have much less atherosclerosis. If you have high levels of APOB, you have much more atherosclerosis. And if you have high levels of LP little a, you have more atherosclerosis. So what about this idea of looking at the APOB-A1 ratio? The inner heart study, which was mentioned yesterday, I hear about it at every lipid meeting since it was published back in 2004, but I don't, a lot of the docs still haven't heard about it. Uh, this was a huge study, about 30,000 um, patients from 52 countries. We're talking every continent, you know, Asia, Africa, Australia, North and South America, everybody, every ethnic group, men and women, young, old, less than 40, over to 70 years old. Talk about generalizability. I mean, this is all of us, okay? Humans, whatever we are. <laughs> um, where they're looking at nine risk factors that predict the risk of heart attack. Okay, some of the things are no surprise. We all know smoking is a major risk factor of heart attack. This slide shows the odds ratio uh, according to the number of cigarettes smoked per day. So for every five cigarettes you smoke per day, look at that line. It goes right up as far as your risk of myocardial infarction. When they looked at all the lipid stuff, the one thing that came out to be the best predictor was the APOBA1 ratio. Look at this. As the APOBA1 ratio went up, so did heart attack risk. This slide I found very interesting. Now, on the left, the very first thing on the left is smoking. The next one is diabetes. The third one is hypertension. And then there's the APOBA1 ratio. We are good at looking and evaluating smoking and diabetes and hypertension, but why the heck are we not looking at ApoBA1? And certainly when you add these together, you get a lot more information. People ask me, what are the nine things, Lynn? Okay, if you look on the left side, the nine things that increase the risk that they looked at for heart attack are smoking, diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity, the psychological stress, which was talked about yesterday, and then the very last one on the bottom is the APOA1 ratio. What were the things that lowered risk of, of MI? And it's um, eating fruits and vegetables, exercise, and some alcohol. So the inner heart results were very strong about teaching us about the importance of utilizing the APOBA1 ratio. It actually had a higher odds ratio than smoking, and the population attributable risk was almost 50%. And the APOBA1 ratio showed a graded relation with heart attack risk with no evidence of a threshold between the top and the lowest decile of APOA1. The authors concluded that if you look at these nine risk factors, it accounts for 90% of the population attributable risk in men and actually 94% in women. Well, what about stroke risk? A couple years after that, the Amora, style, uh, Amora study was published. This study is huge. It's like 170,000 people, and they wanted to look to see if stroke risk would be related to this APOBA1 ratio. 
Again, you have all ages. You have from 20 years old to some of them in their 80s. They excluded people who were in the hospital or who were very ill. They followed them for a little over 10 years on average. And what they used as the reference cell was the highest ApoA1 um, and the lowest um, ApoB. Look what they found. ApoA1 ratio goes up, so does the risk of dying from any type of stroke. The ApoBA1 ratio, what about with all cardiovascular risk, whether it's stroke, heart attack, other ischemic events, uh, aneurysm, again, you have that linear increase. So ApoA1 shows you a lot of information, and there was a strong direct relationship between the increasing values of ApoBA1 ratio and the risk of fatal stroke. The proportions of deaths in this Amora study corresponded, they said, to national and international statistics from other developed countries as far as the incidence of stroke, MI, and aneurysm and stuff. So again, they're pointing to the generalizability of these, of these results. And so what they concluded is that we believe the ApoBA1 ratio is a more robust and more informative and relevant risk marker than lipids and lipoproteins, and based on Amoris and inner heart, that the the ApoBA1 ratio is simple, it's powerful, it's a summary index that can identify patients at risk for ischemic vascular disease. It's easy to use, there's no fasting required, the testing methods are internationally standardized, and it's easier for patients and physicians to estimate risk. Coming from a clinical practice thing, you know, when you have a boatload of stuff and kind of TMI, um, the, the, the practitioners get f confused with all this stuff. You show reports to patients, they get confused. If you can say, we want your ApoBA1 ratio less than 0 0.7, and it's this, and it's that, and you can work with that. And this holds true whether people are not on any treatment or whether they're on treatment. So this is getting into some national guidelines, which we'll talk about. So it's a very valuable tool to monitor the effects of your lipid-lowering therapy if you're intervening on these people. The European guidelines were mentioned uh, this morning. There are joint uh, European Atherosclerosis Society and the European Society of Cardiologists came out with guidelines, again, national recommendation kind of criteria last year. And the things in green are basically uh, clearly indicated that's your standard lipid profile. The things that are in yellow, the 2A, is that evidence favors these things. And it mentions non-HDL cholesterol, LPA, and ApoB. And then they add uh, as a 2B that you can consider, although the evidence wasn't quite as much at that time, the ApoBA1 ratio. Now that was in 2011. Look what's out there this year, 2012, European Guidelines on Cardiovascular Disease Risk uh, Prevention and Clinical Practice. It is beyond doubt that the ApoBA1 ratio is one of the strongest markers. So if we're going to be looking at lipid stuff, I think we need to be looking at um, the ApoBA1 ratio, and we've got a lot of national recommendations and studies and to point to. What about small, dense LDL cholesterol? Small dense LDL cholesterol, a particle size and particle number has been a debate for a while. Um, if you're looking at particle size, generally the predictability of that falls out when you add particle number. Um, but small dense, the people who are believers in size, I think everybody pretty much agrees that small dense dangerous is really the super bad guy out there. So small dense LDL levels at baseline are clearly associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events, and the amount of cholesterol in small dense LDL is associated with ischemic heart disease and independent of ApoB. So there could be some discordance between ApoB and small dense um, LDL, so some practitioners like to look at that as well, and that makes sense. The possible mechanisms of why small dense LDL is so bad is because of the increased susceptibility to oxidation. There are conformational changes that lead to uh, defective uh, interaction with LDL receptors and defective metabolism. And there's an increased um, clearance by scavenger receptors that cause the formation of foam cells. And then there's the association with VLDL remnants and low HDL cholesterol. 
LP Lille was mentioned earlier. What's going on with LP Lille? In the past, you hadn't heard a lot about it because there are all these different methods, and nobody had kind of agreed on, like, what are we doing? What are we saying about LP Lille? We know that LPA has a positive predictive value and is added to measures of risk um, over and above Framingham, uh, is independent of LDL, uh, non-HDL, and other cardiovascular risk factors. The European Atherosclerosis Society last year recommended that one particular method be used, and they said it should be measured once. So the advi we advise that LPA be measured once using an isoform insensitive assay in subjects that are at intermediate or high risk. Why do you measure it once? It's kind of like you're either pregnant or you're not. <laughs> you, know? you either have LPA excess and you're at higher risk or you don't. So it's not something that the guidelines, the international guidelines recommend that you follow every time, all the time. And actually that can lead to frustration with patients. Well, what is LP Lille? LP Lille is a particle that's very similar to LDL cholesterol. It's more easily oxidized. It has this kringle shape on it that uh, resembles plasminogen. It's believed to be competitively in, uh, inhibit uh, plasminogen, and so it makes patients hypercoagulable as well. So it's very complex. Um, it's, the link is between the atherogenicity of LDL cholesterol and the thrombogenicity of plasminogen. If LPA is up along with a high LDL or LPA is up along with a low HDL, these patients do have higher risk. And as I mentioned, some labs measure the total particle mass. That's what Cleveland Heart Lab does. That's the method that is endorsed by the International Atherosclerosis Society. Some labs measure the protein. Some labs measure the cholesterol content. The current National Lipid uh, Association LPA got statement that came out last year advocates, they say since family history is often inaccurate in adults, not just in kids, you know, and the impact of other risk factors is variable, you can argue that anyone with vascular disease, you should screen for LPA excess. Treatment considerations for lowering LPA. I think it's been mentioned uh, a number of these things, the niacin, the estrogen, and I'll lower LP little a. However, that being said, there is no evidence that lowering LP little a with any pharmacologic therapies improves outcomes. There are a number of trials, however, that in patients with LPA excess, if you hammer down ApoB, you also, or water it down, or whatever we're call, calling it to put the fire out, if you hammer it down, there's less coronary morbidity and mortality, less, less events. A VAP test is an example of another test that's available. On this particular test, there is an LP little a. It is not the same method. It is the LPA cholesterol. Uh, it doesn't mean that this company cannot order the test that you want with the immunoassay, but you would have to order it separate from the panel. Uh, the NMR is a very good test. It's used a lot. You'll see it a lot in the literature um, with clinical trials at the research level. Um, you know, the LDL particle on there is, you'll see a lot of articles that'll talk about ApoB and LDL particle number at the same time. I think the reason it's not in the guidelines, again, is because it's not always generally available in a population, um, and it typically costs more. So when you look at these panels and what is supported by expert recommendations and, and national guidelines, you can see that um, the VAP, for instance, does have ApoB and A1. Um, I'm not sure if they report the ratio on that or not. Cleveland Heart Lab's lab has ApoB A1 and does report out the ratio. Um, the LDLP in NMR is very, very good, and NLA will say that it's equally good as ApoB, but again, it doesn't have the national recommendation, as I mentioned before. And LP Lille, the method that is recommended by the International um, Atherosclerosis Sclerosis Society for LPA is the one that's on um, the Cleveland Heart Lab panel. So in summary, of all the tools, tools that we can use to do a better job in reducing the risk of heart attack and stroke, which is what we're about here uh, 
in this room, all of us, it, the standard lipid profile and non-HDL cholesterol need to be used for screening, and it's new, you need to be screening all the kids now. Um, additional um, lipoprotein tests that can help us do a much better job at reducing the risk and putting out the fire include the, a, the LP little a, um, ApoB, A1, and the ratio, and then the small dense LDL can give you some different additional information. You're also aware of the inflammatory tests that give you an idea of more imminent risk um, with the F2 isoprostanes, HSCRP, the microalbumin, MPO, and the, the plaque, LP little a, to uncover hidden risk. So thank you for your attention. I'm trying to catch up on the time, and I hope I did. Thanks.